famous, the Boxing Truth Radio, YouTube edition. Welcome back to the Boxing Truth Radio. I am Ricardo along with John. As always, you know, there's something going on in boxing to have the fan up in arms. So why don't you just give fight fans the fight they want to see? I don't feel like he's done anything to deserve it, especially with the hand wrap scandal. Let's get to last week's action. If you want to chime in, 562-219-3603. He seemed to make some mocking gestures after his fight to the camera that, you know, his wraps were completely clean or whatever. This is bullshit. You don't want to give a good fight to the fans. And I love that we can say that on the Boxing Truth, because we're not on some big website like Boxing Scene or Fight News, and we don't have to worry about, you know, pissing off promoters. But screw you, I don't want a credential. At this point in time, we would like to welcome the CEO of the United States Anti-Doping Agency, Mr. Travis Tigard. How you doing, Travis? I'm doing great. Guys, thanks for having me. No, it's a pleasure, especially with everything that's gone on within the world of boxing within the last six to seven months. When all of a sudden drug testing, or I should say more um, extensive drug testing, is starting to come into light and was a central negotiating point and continues to be a central negotiating point for one of the biggest fights uh, in the history of boxing between Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather. The first question I'd like to ask you is, how long has uh, the United States Anti-Doping Agency and professional boxing boxing been intertwined? I guess the Mayweather-Mosley fight was the first fight that we ran the program for. Of course, a number of the boxers grew up in the Olympic system, so were subject to our testing at the time. In fact, Mayweather, you know, was a 96, I believe, Olympian. We originally got brought in and talked with both camps during the Pacquiao Mayweather negotiations back in December. And so we were, you know, we had several uh, interactions uh, via conference call with both of the camps when they were trying to find out more about the, the drug testing program that we run. So I guess that was really the first time. And then now the, this Mayweather Mosley fight was the first program uh, that we actually implemented for a fight. Can you give us, a, obviously, we know that the your company has extensive drug testing in, in regards to the, the various tests that take place. Can you give us just the gist of the differences between the tests? Testing that the current uh, athletic commission, such as Nevada, does compared to the type of testing that your company does. Yeah, and you know, I, it's kind of funny how you how you phrased it with expensive. I mean, it, you either have as effective as you can be, or or basically ineffective. And of course, there's costs associated with the more effective type of testing, which is what we do. They're comparing apples and oranges. I mean, we do blood and urine. We analyze for EPO. We use. CIR, which is a sophisticated way to look for synthetic steroid use. We look for human growth hormone. We look for blood transfusions. I mean, it's just, it, there's really no comparison, sort of what the routine workplace testing for employees versus what a, you know, a program aimed at truly protecting clean athletes' rights to compete on a level playing field and the integrity in sport. And, and most importantly, in a sport like boxing, a combat sport, and we have several of them in the Olympic movement, karate and taekwondo and judo, the safety of the athletes is a, is a paramount importance um, and should be reason enough alone to have the most effective testing program in place that you can have. Um, we're going to go ahead and open up these phone lines to the boxing fans throughout the globe. Here in the United States, we have callers in the U.K. and Australia, and uh, I'm sure they're going to have a lot of questions because... Because, as you mentioned, uh, the boxing world, the professional boxing world, the drug tests that have been implemented in the past do not compare to these more stringent blood tests that, uh, you know, some in the sport are pushing for. At this point in time, I'd like to welcome a caller out in the state of Ohio, Hershable. Welcome to the Boxing Truth Radio. You're on the line with Travis Tigart. Hey, how you doing, sir? Do you think it's just a dangerous precedent for the uh, athletes themselves to be able to demand the terms of the testing like Floyd is doing? Hey, thanks for the question. You know, I, it, this is about clean athletes. It's not about USADA. It's not about me. It's, it's about clean athletes. So I think what we learned in the Olympic movement, in order to have an effective program put in place to protect their rights, athletes have to stand up. And it shouldn't be tolerated by athletes, a culture that doesn't protect their rights. And, and so, no, I think the opposite. I think any athlete who has the courage to stand up and demand the best testing available, look, no system's perfect, but to demand the best system possible, they ought to be supported. And I think they ought to have the ability to, to put in the kind of testing they want. But too frequently, and we see it in our sports, athletes are treated like property, and they don't have a say. And it's the sport organizations, it's the promoters, it's all those that are making the money from sport. And so, you know, I think what's refreshing about this, and, and it's no different than what we saw back in the late 90s with Olympic athletes, you, you have athletes that have the ability, whether it's because of their platform, because they're the best in the world, whatever it might be, to say enough is enough 
and I'm going to do everything possible to put the best system in place. Again, no system is perfect, but by far the gold standard of the WADA code, which we run here in the United States, is the recognized gold standard for any sort of testing program. So I, I think you got to support those. And if, if you truly value clean sport and you want to protect the athletes' rights, and, and frankly, guys, it's not only about the elite athletes of today, but it's about the athletes of tomorrow. And I'm a father of three. And if you don't think our kids don't look up to their role models, and if you don't think the pressures to win at all costs, to have that ability to make a 25 $5 million dollar fight or sign a $25 million dollar baseball contract doesn't seep down to the high school level and the junior high level or my eight-year-old daughter's soccer team, you're crazy. And and I hope that the discussion in boxing keeps all of those factors in mind as this moves forward, because that's what this is about. It's about the kids who are coming up in the ranks and are going to do the same very thing to be the best they possibly can be if they think they can get away with it and be successful and, and earn the kind of money that a lot of these sports are, are generating. We have a caller from the San Diego area out there in Southern California. You are on the line with the CEO of the United States Anti-Doping Agency. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I was wondering, why was blood not taken 18 days prior to the fight if blood was so superior to urine and urine was continued to be taken not blood. I guess you're referring to the Mosley uh, Mayweather fight where there have been some reports that the blood test stopped 18 days before the fight. Uh, I'm not sure if you could comment on that, uh, you know, in yeah, terms absolutely. of legal issues and whatnot, but go ahead. No, no, listen, absolutely. I think there's a lot of fault cities out there. One of the fault cities out there is that we didn't do any testing 18 days prior to the fight. That's false. We did urine testing well into the week before the fight and the post fight, and anybody that saw 20 24-7, the HBO, saw us showing up at Mosley's as he was leaving for Las Vegas to collect a urine sample. Um, it's also been reported that we had a cutoff for testing, and that is also absolutely false. There was no cutoff whatsoever for testing. So, so to get to your specific question, why did we not blood test within the 18-day period? We did urine test, important. We, got, we, were, we were totally comfortable and, and this included, you know, input from our chief science officers as well as our chief sport officers that we were running a highly effective program given the number of tests that we did, the intensity of those tests. We looked at the compliance so there were no missed tests on these athletes, and we looked at the thoroughness of the testing and the results of those testing. And you couple that with the fact that we're saving samples for an eight-year period of time to retest at a later date if we choose to, we were totally fine not testing these boxers for blood within that period of time. And, and remember, the right to test is what adds the deterrent and the detection element. These athletes knew we could test them during that time period. That in and of itself is a deterrent. And we were comfortable, based on all the factors I just told you, not performing a blood test in that period of time. And, of course, we consider the athlete's participation in an event or an athletic competition, and we're not going to do anything that in any way, whether actually or in perception, could be used as an excuse of why they performed poorly in a fight. You look at the totality of the circumstances, and, and this was a highly effective program we ran in a short period of time, given all the factors I've just discussed. So let me ask you this question. Let's say an athlete was taking performance-enhancing drugs perhaps half a year ago. From what you understand how the body works and how your testing is done, is there any way that you'd be able to catch somebody who would possibly, maybe now they're clean, maybe they're not, now they're not taking anything, but with your stringent testing methods, could you actually see that there are traces of any performance enhancing drug from I guess maybe months or even years prior? Yeah, we would have preferred more time. We would have loved to have in the Olympic movement we have basically a six month practice. We got comfortable here and, and this was really a decision that we made at the beginning whether or not to engage the testing given that we only had I think seven or eight weeks to perform the program. We, we would have liked more time, no question about that. 